good evening. Yes. And welcome to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. As faculty director for the humanities at the Institute, I'd like to both thank you and to congratulate you for coming to this event, which I think will not only be illuminating, but also great fun. My name is Shigehisa Kuriyama, but only for a few more minutes. <laughs> for over the course of the next two hours, I've been given the opportunity to become someone else, someone new, someone whom I've never known in my 64 years on Earth, <laughs> and yet someone who has doubtless been within me all along, waiting for this evening with you and the magic of talented transformation artists uh, who are with us tonight. So tonight you'll get a chance to witness this transformation live, not only in me, but also in Professor Robin Bernstein, a current Radcliffe Fellow and Chair of the Department of Women's Sexual Sexuality and Gender here at Harvard and was gamely ag agreed to join, uh, join me in this adventure. Harvard professors in drag. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? <laughs> but then again, why not? It's an experiment, and frankly, nobody knows how exactly it's going to turn out. But as you track our gradual metamorphoses, into people whose gender will probably seem much less clear than they seem right now. I'd like you to bear three things in mind. The first, probably most important, is that Robin and I are basically you. We're merely stand-ins, and in observing the changes that we're, we are undergoing, you have to imagine yourselves um, being transformed. You must imagine yourselves exploring the possible selves within you that have not yet been realized. The second point that I'd like you to think about is the remarkable power of the art form known as drag to spotlight the enthralling complexity of human identity. How the many different permutations of sex, sexuality, and gender take on infinite gradations as they begin combined with the performance and the communication of gender. This is one of the central lessons of the wonderful 2017 documentary called Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens, around which this evening's activities are organized. And we're privileged and delighted to be joined this evening by Gabrielle and Jen Burton, two of the five sisters who produced this film, as well as five uh, drag performers, some of whom actually you'll see in the film. So here's the trailer for the film. When people think of sex and gender, it's black and white. Drag is a way to show the gray areas because it's not black and white. It's never been black and white. The root of a lot of violence and bullying and stuff like that is not about sexual orientation. It's about gender identity or gender expression. So I can have a different gender identity from my physical sex, and that has nothing to do with who I want to have sex with? What? I'm a teacher by day and a drag king by night. I go to the Roy Renegades shows. I thought it was awesome, but I said, there's no way in hell I would ever do that. I would never glue hair on my face. All of a sudden, some of the people who voted against gay people having the same rights as straight people in the state are saying, well, why can't Julie have any time to stay home with your family when you had a baby? They have that feeling of like, well, I would never want you to not be able to be with your son. I know that my parents saw a very different picture for me. 
I think they wanted me to go into politics and be a lawyer. They also saw me getting married, having kids. I plan on having a white picket fence, and I plan on having children, but I plan on doing it with an, another man. Oh, no, we have, I mean, the only time we have sex is when it's in drag. No. <laughs> Do not use that, that is so <laughs> That will never happen, ever. I had to sit down and ask my brother, like, how to be a guy, like, how to walk a guy. I'm a trans guy. I'm doing theater. This isn't drag for me. I don't think being a man is bad. I don't think being a woman is bad. I just happen to be really in the middle. A drag show in Ohio? I didn't even know there were 400 lesbians in Ohio. It's okay to be who you are. I mean, that's what it's about. Like, not being afraid to be who you are. I don't have to be a man. I don't have to be a woman. I just have to be me. So in a few moments, uh, Gabrielle and Jen will speak to you in greater detail about the movie and the interplay of gender and drag performance. And you'll be treated some, to some um, terrific performers, uh, performances uh, by our artists. But I want to conclude with a third and more general lesson that the encounter with drag might teach us. And that's a lesson about latent, unrecognized possibilities. And here I'm going to introduce something that I'm sure you never expected um, in uh, 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 an event on drag. Um, Drag invites us, I think, to ask, what if? What if we tried something that we never, not only never tried before, but never even thought of trying? What wonderful new truth about the world, about ourselves, might we discover? And I want to illustrate this, and this is the unexpected part, with a simple example about something that probably most, something that probably most of you have never tried, and certainly not tried in connection with reflections on gender. And the thing I have are paper. Everybody has paper. Everybody's handled strips of paper. But if you, have you ever thought about the potential of two strips of paper? Think you could have all sorts of associations. One is sex, sexuality. One is John and... Joanna, John, and Mary, um, the body and performance. There are all sorts of things that one could associate with these two. Now, if you were to take the strip of paper and glue them together and then cut them, what would you get? You get two rings. Everybody knows this. But here's something that probably you, you have never tried. Suppose you have two strips, and you glue them together. And then what you can do, let's see here in terms of unexpected possibilities. <laughs> this is something that you can try at home, right? It's PG, no, no, it's, you can do it with four-year-olds. Um, sorry. So you're going to glue, uh, one and the other, so that you end up with two rings. Right? Simple enough. Definitely try this at home. Now, before, if we had one ring and we cut it, cut it apart, you know you get two rings. What happens if, if I now take this and split this? Does anybody know? Again, it's not something that you do every day. You know, it's not part of your daily practice. Uh oh, let's see if I can cut this. You get one, one ring, four rings, anything else? Any other takers before I finally so we have four rings. You have one ring, but what do you get? Oops. Oh. 
and get a square. Who'd have thought it, right? Now let me, so we have two straight strings and we got this. And is this what I just showed? Let me just sort of lost track. This is, see how user friendly we are. We want to make sure that, that you're able to do this at home. So you just saw the result. And we're going to the second uh, possibility. So now you get, oh, maybe there's something more to these ordinary strips of paper than you thought. And you think, OK, now I know. I can try something different, which is you take two cross strips, and you make one ring, but the second time, you add a twist, right? You add a twist. So you, again, you can imagine, OK, sex, sexuality, John and Jen. There are all sorts of variations you can think of. So this time, instead of just the two straight rings, you're going to get one with a twist. So what is the result of that process? Any takers here? <laughs> Tetrahedron? OK. Uh, somebody who knows a lot about geometry, uh, but not really about sex. <laughs> So again, don't take my word for it, try it. What you get, interestingly enough, oops, is again, you'll get a square, even with a twist. So final experiment. Think, OK, that's been going pretty well. This time, we're going all the way, right? We're going to go and make two interlinked rings with one twisted toward the right and one twisted toward the left. What's going to happen? <laughs> OK. So pessimist. Um, da -da. Well, it doesn't look like it's going to be a square. What is it going to look like? Let's see, just go a little, oops, we're stuck here. If you unfold it, what you find is basically two linked hearts. And I think this is a good lesson. Now, what I'd like you to think about is this. Paper is such a simple thing. It only has two sides. Anybody can use this, right? Human beings are so much more complicated than a two-sided sheet of paper. Think of the possibilities. So that's one of the themes of this evening. Um, and I'd like now to turn it over to uh, Jen and Gabriel. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lisa. That was so wonderful. So I'm Jennifer Burton, and this is my sister, Gabrielle Burton. And we are two of the five sisters. We have a company, Five Sisters Productions. We've made seven feature films, many commercials, shorts, um, and including many that look at gender from different angles and perspectives. We've made the MTV logo film, Happiest Day of His Life, which is the perfect, picture-perfect wedding, all gender reversed. Um, we've made, uh, we're making a, sh a series of short films called Half the History on the Undertold Stories of Women in American History. We have a new film coming out that's um, about parenting and gender, and of course, Kings, Queens, and in-betweens. 
Tonight, I also wanted to add, is a particularly celebratory night. We're very happy to be kicking off the 2019 conference. And also tonight, one of our performers in the film, Nina West, is premiering on the RuPaul Drag Show. So, so that's exciting. Hashtag Team Nina. Um, <laughs> So we made this film because we were interested in capturing gender diversity and the complexity of gender performance, both on and off stage. Drag is a perfect window to open up these questions about how we define identity in our society, how we might get beyond the binaries of, say, male, female, straight, gay, masculine, feminine, and instead create space to recognize the complexity of all of our humanity. Using music and costumes and movement, drag goes beyond words to explore new possibilities for the aesthetics of gender. As so much of gender is communicated non-verbally, we'd like to start by introducing you to some of the performers we were lucky enough to be able to film for Cakes, Queens, and In-Betweens. Uh, um, I need to remind you that Harvard's campus is cash-free, so you have to refrain from tipping these performers. <laughs> So without further ado, here are members of the Royal Renegades. The Reverend Roy Rogers, Twinkle Bell. <laughs> um, I'll read all the names, then you can applaud. Um, Twinkle Bell, Topher Wright, Dr. Kalithan, Jaden Jameson, and Queen, drag queen Anissa Love. As so much of drag is about transformation, we'd like now to invite our two professor volunteers up to begin the transformation. <laughs> and, okay, so we have um, Hisa Koryama, who you met, and um, Robin Bernstein to start, who will be here. And as we start the transformation, we're gonna be showing the first clip, which is seven minutes long and lays out some of the issues about drag and gender. So we'll get you set up with your chairs. For me, it's not about gender, at least. I, th I think it's easy for him to say that it's not about gender because I don't honestly think in his mind it is about gender at all. I think like, but I don't think that drag from out the outside perspective cannot be about gender in our society, whether it's subconscious or not. Like, I feel like it is still, it says a lot about gender whether it's meant to or not. Because when you get on stage for drag and I say, I'm Toby, a drag king, there is an expectation from the audience that I look like a man. And then I get judged on how masculine I look. I like to blur all that stuff. I like to be feminine and masculine at the same time because there's a whole continuum of where people are in terms of gender. And so I want to mix all that up. It's a complicated issue because I'm dressing like a woman. But really, I'm not really dressing like a woman. <laughs> when you think about it, it's, it's, it's such a character. You know, it's a big hair, pounds and pounds of, tell me what woman wears that much makeup. Gender really is this made up thing in our head to keep everybody in order. That, that, that's all it really is. It doesn't even make any sense. No sense whatsoever. Not every girl looks good in pastels. For gay men, I'll say that I think it's very difficult to live up to a standard of what you think masculinity is supposed to be. There's this kind of like Will and Grace style gay man that's like everybody's best friend at the office, you know? And I don't know that there's quite that lesbian identity of like, oh, you know, my best friend's like, that the straight guys at the office are gonna be like, oh, my best friend's a lesbian, I'm gonna take her to like get some power tools with me. Oh you know? no, the flip side is the coach, you right, know? Right. Or the beast, you know, the big old coach butch woman who's, you know, scary, scares everyone. I remember when at 13, I had to ask my brother, literally, I had to sit down with my brother, who was like football playing, you know, beating up people, guy, and lifting weights. I had to sit down and ask my brother, like, how to be a guy, like, how to walk like a guy. And yeah, I remember him sitting down and showing me how to walk. It's like you raise your eyebrows and you smile. Hi, oh, there's a girl, little baby in here. Oh, that's so cute. I mean, you know, and if you talk like that, people are gonna be like, oh, well, this person has to be a woman. I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to do, like, Boy stuff like fix a car or you know fix a computer or anything like that's that. Like, that's not necessarily kind of boy stuff though. Um, this is how I'm comfortable. I'd rather not wear baggy clothes and backwards hats and um, polo shirts. That's that's me. This is 
how I, no one criticizes me for the way I dress because I pass for what feminine is supposed to be. There, there actually is a moment in the film Paris is Burning where one of the characters is talking about wanting to, like knowing that he wanted to be a woman because he wanted to like wear frilly underwear and carry a purse. And I'm like, well, I'm a woman and I've never worn frilly underwear and I don't carry a purse. Some of our greatest chefs and cooks are men. But at the same time, they'll tell you in the household, in a heterosexual relationship, it should be the woman that cooks. Now, how, does, how do you make sense of that? You know what? I'm a guy and I am feminine and I have the right to be feminine and there's nothing wrong with that. And I am a guy, I don't have to be your stereotype of a guy. Even in the trans community, there's a lot of expectations there of what you're supposed to be. And I have people telling me all the time, why are you messing it up for the rest of us? People look at you and they see you with your pink hair and acting like a girl. And that tells people that being a trans guy isn't real and that you're faking it and that you're messing it up. And then it's like, what can you say to that? Except I'm just, trying to live my life. The root of a lot of violence and bullying and stuff like that is not about sexual orientation. It's about gender identity or gender expression. I mean, cultural expectations that if you have a vagina, you will be a female, you will then have a certain kind of femininity and then all of, you know, certain jobs and certain power dynamics and certain relationships to someone of the opposite sex who has a penis and all of the expectations that go along with that. And people who don't follow those rules get pushed around. And it happens on the playground when you're five and it happens in the corporate world when you're 50. But the binary of gender maintains things like the census where you have to pick, are you a man or a woman? Are you male or female? Um, but there are, all, are obvious alternatives. Like we could ask people, where do you sit on a spectrum or a continuum between ma masculine and feminine? Super feminine, super butch. I think there's a lot of us out there that just kind of fall in the middle. It comes to mind for me is going to the bathroom in a public place um, as, a, as a woman who it reads as, mas as masculine often. Um, I get, I've had years of stares and gasps and oh, are you in the right place? You know, that kind of thing. But I don't, no woman responds with violence towards me. They respond with like shock or something. You know, you kind of watch over your back to see what's happening behind you. You know, if you're walking down the street, you know, even though nothing would ever happen, nothing ever has, you always are kind of keeping an eye open, you know, to a I would say like, nothing ever happened. No, I mean, you know, you get, People will yell something, but I'll tell you. Yeah, you got egged. But not in drag. I think you get, I think you have, you have more problems just as a gay man than you do as a drag queen. When people think of sex and gender, it's black and white. And for me, drag is a way to show the gray areas because it's not black and white. It's never been black and white. The really fun part of drag is playing around with what gender can mean. I can have like a package in my pants and still not be bound. So you could be this masculine person who is this male identified character, yet the male -like character that you're identifying is just is a really femme. Once he starts singing, it drops all gender barriers. It's the freedom of drag. And I don't have to be a man to do drag. I don't have to be a woman, I just have to be me. And I really think that that's what the essence of drag is. Thanks. Um, this conference is about gender and communication, and we're so happy to be here with Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens and the performers, uh, some of the performers who were in it. It took us over six years to make the movie because we wanted to get it right. And in our film company, we sisters have often thought about the issues that are communicated through media um, about gender. What our subconscious and conscious messaging is telling us through those images. There's a fundamental question about identity. Um, how we communicate identity uh, beyond words, and how our cultural presumptions, stereotypes, and traditions play into that, either influencing or reinforcing what is being communicated. Drag shakes all that up. It shakes up a binary system that is often imposed upon our thinking. Drag makes us question what we see, what we perceive in the layers of what we might know or what we actually think we know. The communication of gender within drag is completely up for grabs. Now, not literally, though that does happen at some shows. <laughs> um, but gender and identity in drag are not defined or communicated through clothing, hair quaffing, or other indicators that we typically stereotype. 
Drag uses its art form to shake up the whole idea of what it means to be female or male. Um, and within an LGBTQ performing space, it also raises questions of how we communicate sexuality. Is it on the surface? Is it in our swagger? Or in our engagement with an audience who knows perhaps how we represent ourselves outside of that space? Recently, the Me Too movement has brought communication and gender to the forefront, gathering the strengths of millions of individual voices and amplifying their gendered experiences, helping them to be heard as a group and strength. Ultimately, for Jen and me, all the performers of this who are here tonight, questioning these assumptions is the key. Questioning ourselves and raising questions, perhaps, in the conversations we have with others. And there's also then a celebratory acceptance of welcoming in not defining others, of welcoming in one's own self-definition, whatever that might be, and of all of it being OK, because we're each masterpieces in the making. Drag com communicates that to the audience, that that's what we are, whoever we are, and whatever experiences we might be having in life or have had, whatever pain we might be in, and the joys too. This is an art form that celebrates the beauty of every person and connects us into one fabric of humanity, because this is who we are. And here's Anissa Love. So that since there's so many drag queens in Columbus, it's just kind of um, who's selected and who's performing. It's a very straight crowd on Friday nights, which we love, but but sometimes takes them a little bit longer to get into because they don't know us necessarily, you know, personally. And and then Saturday, at six o'clock starts getting really rowdy, and then ten o'clock's really crazy, and then Sundays are just really drunk. <laughs> so. <laughs> Celebrities in Hollywood use Pam to take their faces off at night. Does Richard Chamberlain use Pam to take his face off at night? Well, you can see from that clip how hard work professional drag can be. And you can make money, but there are certainly other easier ways to make a living. <laughs> so what draws people to perform drag? The answers range from self-expression to politics to community. And when we have the Q&A, you may want to ask some of the performers what brings them to drag and what drag means to them. In thinking about tonight's event, I was also thinking about what draws me and my sisters to explore gender in our work. It took me way back to when we were children growing up in Washington, DC, and my parents joined the feminist movement in the 70s. 
My mother went from a traditional housewife who dressed up for going out in a bouffant and in pearls and heels, and she went from that to giving up skirts for jeans, having long hair, no makeup. Now this was just at the time when my sisters and I were starting to enter adolescence, when she was consciously giving up all of the traditional trappings of femininity. So what it did for us is we started equating traditional gender expression for women with sexism. And we developed this sort of secret code amongst ourselves that was really a rigid policing. <laughs> so there was no makeup, of course, uh, no twirly skirts, those were definitely bad, uh, no shaving, which was hard in a large public school system, and no dangly earrings. I still remember the moment that my sister Maria had grown a little bit older and she insisted on buying these Snoopy earrings that fell just below uh, the earlobe. And it felt as if so much was at stake <laughs> that this decision could start everything crumbling and lead to her ruin. So fast forward to graduating from Harvard Radcliffe. I majored here in drama before they had a drama major. I did a special concentration in nonverbal communication and theater. And I ended up getting a fellowship to go to Japan to study traditional Japanese theater, kabuki and no. And there is a very strong tradition of drag in the national theatrical tradition of Japan. So one of the first dances that my kabuki sensei taught me is sakura. And he taught it to me as a female, which is very small and in, and you do these kind of movements, and you speak in a very high voice. And then he taught it to me as a man, and it's open and big and loud and low. And over the course of the year, I realized that I didn't want to be this, and I didn't want to be this, but I was somewhere in between. And studying this theater for a year, it gave me the ability to decide myself about gender in my life and work without listening too hard to what others, including my mother, thought about the way that one should be. So my son and daughter are growing up now in Brookline where they have a dizzying number of options for how they want to look and act, which carries its own difficulties for adolescents. But the key difference is that they are navigating at a time when we are developing the words, when we are finding models for being what I as a child, vigilant about the dangerous slippery slope of dangling earrings, could never ever have imagined. Thank you. gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. I got it? Yes. Everybody has a sex, a gender, and a sexuality. And they're mutually exclusive. One does not dictate the other. Sex, gender, and sexuality are three separate things. Like, oh my god, so I can have a different gender identity from my physical sex? And that has nothing to do with who I want to have sex with? What? Okay, so sex is your physicality. I'm a man or a woman. Sexuality is who am I attracted to. And then gender is everything that's socially constructed around me. A woman should be very feminine and everything that represents feminine. And a man should be very masculine and everything that represents masculine. Maybe they were born female, they're transitioning to male, but they're attracted to men. Then a lot of people would say, well then why wouldn't you just stay a girl? And then you'd be normal. And that's not how it works either. I don't know, I don't think that any one person is necessarily gay or straight. I don't think any one person is necessarily male or female. I think you have traits of both involved in everybody. I don't think that it would be impossible for me to date a man. I can, I, in fact, I can see it happening, but it wouldn't be a, a straight man. It would be like a gay man or a transgendered man. Like, I, could, I can definitely see that. 
I have only and still have only dated straight guys. Um, I don't consider myself... I consider myself in the gay community because I support the gay community and I'm definitely, you know, a huge fan of the gay community. But I consider myself... I like to say straight. I am in a relationship. I, I'm in a 15-year, I think, relationship. Been married 11 years with a born female who does not necessarily um, see herself as a lesbian or even or even gay. It's just me who she fell for. I think most people label me as queer because I am attracted to so many different people. And in the male gay community, are you welcomed in? Uh, yeah, but I mean, there are some, there are a lot of gay men obviously who want somebody with biological, biologically male parts, but uh, there are a lot of men that just want that masculine physique that, you know, if you've got that, it doesn't matter what you have underneath the clothes. I recognize Kristen as a drag king when she's performing, but uh, I, li I mean, I like that she's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> we have people who are women, who identify as women, and their bodies represent womanhood to them, but then they get with someone on stage who they're partnering to make it a straight couple. But then queer people are watching that and seeing it as a queer relationship. They don't be like, hey, look at those straight people. This is hot. They're like, I know that those are both girls, and I think that's sexy. So the way that desire is placed on drag performance is one of the most fascinating things. So now we're going to check in with uh, you can you can keep working, keep working. <laughs> So um, I have a mic coming up, I believe. I swear I'm not going to knock your eye out. It's going to do a mic for a Robin. Here they come. Here we are. So, oh, here they are. My mistake. Um, so Robin, I wanted to ask, what is this experience like so far? Well, I haven't seen myself. I have no idea what I look like right now. This is definitely the most makeup I've ever had on my face. <laughs> um, so would you like to talk a little bit about um, sort of in terms of... <laughs> I'm so distracted. <laughs> I think I'll go over on this side for just a second. <laughs> Um, Hisa, what do you, uh, <laughs> what, what is this experience like for you so far? Um, looking good is hard work. <laughs> that yeah. is for sure. So, Corey, can you talk a little bit about, um, what's happening right yes, now? Yes. What, what kind of things have you, Here, have you been can, working on? I can hold on? it. You can keep working. Perfect. Um, well, it's really weird because when you try to take a masculine face, I will say this now, Asian men are perfect specimens because you already have these beautiful high cheekbones. Hey. But no, hey, but normally when you're trying to take a masculine face and make feminine features, it takes a lot more work and chiseling. We don't have that kind of time. So we're just making shit out of Shinola. It's gonna be beautiful. <laughs> He'll be delicious, I swear. <laughs> she gonna be so pretty. He said, was this sort of what you expected? I mean, when we pitched this idea to you, did you have, <laughs> he said, ah, no. did you have any idea? I had no idea. I had no idea. But, but it's great. Um, <laughs> That's what they said on the Titanic, too. <laughs> <laughs> a great OK, movie. well, come on over here. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you've been doing to, uh, to transform Robin. So typically there are certain features that is um, typically a stereotype of masculine. So what I'm trying to do is paint Robin's face in a way that you are seeing the furrowed uh, eye. Men tend to have that ridge and they tend to have more of a pronounced nose. So I'm trying to bring that, those features forward using makeup. Interesting. Okay. And do you have a plan for any facial hair for her? Or is it yes, it's coming. No, no, no. I know. I was just going to see if you wanted to talk about that because this is our check-in, sort of what your plan is. 
<laughs> I was not saying you're behind schedule. I was. <laughs> Yes, uh, there it will be facial hair as well. Um, I have to set the makeup first, and actually the facial hair is just the, I guess the you know topping on the cake. But essentially, the makeup forms the foundation for you. Create those features first. So, without those features, facial hair re really doesn't do much in terms of like the transformation. So I need to set the face first. And then we asked Robin to do a little preparation for the facial hair, so you could talk about what you did. Oh sure. Well. I got a haircut and um, saved the hair. <laughs> so I've got a Tupperware right over there uh, with my hair. And I had to chop it up really fine, which took a really long time. Uh, so, so that's where it's coming from. So then it'll all match. OK, so um, basically, drag involves many different times, types of gender and physical transformation. And these can include binding, tucking, packing, facial hair, clothing, wigs, and so on. So while our amazing uh, professor volunteers are getting their final transformations, we thought we would show you a five minute clip that gives you a little insight into what courage it took for them to accept being here and part of tonight's <laughs> performance. I had seen Virginia West perform before I knew Chris. And then when I saw Chris, I met Chris and talked, and then I found out he was Virginia West. And then I saw Virginia again. And it, I mean, it just blew my mind. I still have never seen him actually tape up and everything like that. I've seen him take it off, but I've never seen him tape up. I don't know that I necessarily want to see that. I don't think stuff. anybody should ever see that. <laughs> I think it seems like that to me, that just feels like mutilation. Like that just looks like it hurts. I'm not interested in seeing that. I mean, there's so many times where I would like to inflict that pain, but <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> there's going to be so much things. That... Well, I, don't, I think you think, do, do you think I tape? I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't I know don't. how it happens. I don't actually. I know a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of drag queens will tape. It, but I don't because I wear I wear pads, hip pads, and I wear so many pair of tights that you know it, I don't have to do that. But that would be pain. I, I can understand what like that like is. for me putting the balls up inside of you. Does that not happen? You so you have your ball sack. Wow, we're getting real real. Well, see, real. like I this is obviously not going to be a PG documentary, <laughs> but like I mean that. That just seems like it hurts. They naturally go in there. No, they don't on me. <laughs> they don't on me. That hurts. That hurts. I have a thing with my partner. He doesn't love it. He appreciates that he knows that that's how he met me and he knows that's what I do. But he said, how long does it take you to get out of that? And I said, about 10 minutes. He goes, can you cut it to five? When it comes to binding, some people use like an ace bandage. I tend to go with the duct tape. Other people have full outfits they wear underneath their clothes. Um, I don't know what they're called. Post-surgical type compression vests that, that really, it's like a whole sort of shirt that you wear. Ace wrap is the worst thing that's ever happened to drag, even though it's like this a staple for drag. I mean, I use it too, but um, it really, one, you can't dance in it. You bend over, you do any of these things and it's gonna roll down and you have to duct tape your skin and it cinches your ribs and it constricts every time you breathe because it's supposed to be compressing you. Okay, good. Use them up. Okay, go easy there. Okay, so we just need to come around because what happened is like this happens to me too. It'll start pushing up too much and then it looks really weird and lumpy. We like that. But we like a little bit of one. Let's rough today. Go ahead and spin. Okay. Man cakes. Man cakes. Ready? We're gonna end it here, and then what we're gonna do is put a shirt on to see how it looks. Cause she's good with these. I don't like that on me, but she likes that on Tony Walnuts. He oh, likes so that. So I have him. the biggest pecs. In yeah, the I know you're like a Jersey Shore guy. So we'll readjust it. Cause it's a little lumpy, but when you put a shirt on over the shirt, yeah. I think we need a little bit here. Okay. It's going to get my armpit. It's fine. All right. 
many, many, many nights do I cut this off of my skin. I've had like scratches on my body. I've literally, my back is literally bled from the mark of pulling this off. Okay. That's good. I can breathe, but not as deeply as I used to be able to. All right. That's good. Looks good. Thanks, bud. All right. It's sort of like a, a tank top, and then it pulls all the way down to here. And they also make ones that are short that are just here. Um, and then it just smooths you and flattens you out. And when I had a bigger chest, when I first transitioned, I was like a D. I absolutely refuse to wear a tight binder all day because. Uh, so this one is significantly tighter, at least because it's like super flat. Okay. <laughs> you, do, you do the classic binder hop. <laughs> Any sane person isn't gonna wear this for very long. It's better than an ace bandage. I mean, an ace bandage is a nightmare. It cuts into your skin. The binders cut into your skin too, but like it's just not as bad and it distributes the pressure so much better so i you know if you're just bound up here it like really wrecks your lower back you tape the fat away <laughs> How does that feel? Oh, painful. It's terrible. That's the worst part. Yeah. Yeah, no peeing for the rest of the night now. So I, um, I think we need to get just a little bit more time in. So we're going to go a little bit off script here and um, ask Ethan Balk to come to the stage to talk about something, an issue that is interesting in the idea of. <laughs> <laughs> of gender and sort of going beyond words, and that isn't about tipping. Um, one of the interesting experiences that um, we had in making the film was one night I was going to go film Ethan performing in this big contest that was Nina West, So You Think You Can Drag. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it was an interesting moment as a documentarian because I felt a need. It was in a gay bar, um, and I felt a need to tell Ethan about something that I'd observed gender-wise, um, about the way tipping was done and was accepted. And so um, basically, I went up to Ethan and I said, hey, you know, you're going into this gay bar. And one of the things that a lot of the kings did was taking the money and sort of throwing it off to the side. And I said, that's not the way that men in that space actually address money. And there is this moment that's very shared. And part of it, it seemed to me, had to do with lesbians demanding money of other lesbians coming to see the show, which was a different economic situation. Um, and so the whole layers of politics, economics, and gender uh, came into that. And I just wanted to have you talk a little bit about that um, and how then you were able to incorporate that into your performance in that space, which was phenomenal anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll <admit to> that. <laughs> No, that, uh, so first of all, when I did this competition, this was years before I decided to start testosterone and transition. So I, it's great, you know, it's fun to watch the film and see myself and I'm like, oh my God, I look so tiny <laughs> and young. <laughs> uh, so it was such great feedback and it was something that I had not thought of and had been doing while performing, you know, as a drag queen, king, as a drag king in, in spaces that were comfortable for drag kings to perform. Because really before I had done this contest, there just, there wasn't a mix yet. There was drag kings doing stuff over here and drag queens doing stuff over here. And this was Nina West's first you know, she was like, I'm gonna do this, you know, this drag competition, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so. You were the first drag king. I was the first, yeah, it. I was the only drag king <laughs> yeah. in the competition, and I was psychotic about it. <laughs> I could ask my wife about it, who's back there. Um, and 
before, you know, I was upstairs, I was practicing, before I went on, Gabrielle was like, listen, I noticed that Chris and Andrew, Virginia and Nina, when they go to take a tip, they connect, they connect with the person, right? They look them in the eye, and there's this exchange, and it was like, and I was like, oh my God. And so I did that, and that's probably the reason I won, I guess. I <laughs> no, it's because he was so good. Yeah, no, but um, I, I did that, I did that, and it, it changed the game for me, and from then on, I, I don't know why, there's probably a lot of gender structure into why I did not feel comfortable doing that. But at that point, then I was like, oh my God, I had no idea I wasn't doing that. And so then, you know, from then on, we just did it a different way. I think to me, what I observed was there was a socioeconomic different reality in these different spaces. So some people had a lot more disposable income and cash and higher incomes and other people who didn't. And so within the the um, club where the kings often performed, that was not as high a socioeconomic um, audience. And so the idea of then expecting people to give you money was sort of a demand on the audience where it was appreciated, but it wasn't um, emphasized. It there, there wasn't you know, put in that way. But then additionally, I thought, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in this interpretation, but the, the idea of how a man would handle money, being given it from somebody and being strong in that expression was about, hey, I've got this money, but it's just, you know, I don't need this. I'm going to throw it back there, because it's just like small change. Whereas in the other space, every dollar matters, and that was sort of what I called the stripper moment to you. Well, you have to have that connection of this is my money, I'm buying something from you for it, and when you're made to feel like the center of the world in that space, it had a different yeah, feeling, and I, right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. I'm learning, because now I present as a white guy, so now... <laughs> Let me just mansplain this right now. <laughs> that, you know, it was almost like when we would take the dollar, I, I, I bet there was something where it was like, I don't know if we really deserve this. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so silly. And I don't think that was the same way as how, you know, males performing felt. Mm -hmm. So it was a good... It was a good Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in this one tiny detail, it was something that I felt you were going into this other space and was important to know. So it was sort of this interesting ethical moment that we had talked about of, do I say something, do I not? As say a documentarian, do yeah, you don't interfere. Or do I change the reality? And so I felt it was an important thing to sort of build a bridge between these two communities, which then happened after that show, is that Ethan started to be invited into the shows in that space, and so did Becky, and then it became this King's Queen's things, and now the, that space incorporates gender queer performers and a lot of, um, uh, well, what would you, I mean, some kings sometimes, and whenever you come back, yeah, you're the in the shows. it's the whole spectrum. Yeah. There's more kings now. There's kind of gender queer in-betweens. There's mm -hmm. guys that are dancing. There's girls that are dancing, and they identify cisgender. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's something about that spectacle. Yeah. When you have everyone up there on stage, that makes it even harder to sort of define and quantify, right? And also even the mixing up, like we've talked to, we have, um, I have a colleague who um, performs sometimes as a bearded queen. And so mixing up even within your uh, character that you're taking on, you know, having it be these sort of giving very, very strong gender cues, but of different genders. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's see how we're doing. We'll have a check-in. <laughs> hey, you guys, how's it going back there? <laughs> so why don't we open up for a question? <laughs> it's going well. This is how it goes backstage. <laughs> just never we, we've gone fast. <laughs> That's right. So we're, we actually are ahead of schedule according to our thing. So we can ask a pre-question before the Q&A um, if you want to, if anybody has anything for now. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So what got you into drag? Me? Oh, good question. Me? Oh my gosh, that's so great. Uh, <laughs> we were going to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, God, it's this whole evolutionary thing, right? So it's, um, you know, when I first started doing this, I hadn't started testosterone yet. I was still like, okay, I guess I'm a lesbian, and that's the two choices I have, besides the other choice that was clearly not working out. Uh, 
So, you know, I had al I've always loved theater, and it, it's always been a, a part of my life. Um, I wish it would have been more. Of, it's been a part of my life where it was like, I love this, but I don't want to be a girl on stage. So it's like, okay, what am I going to do? I, I don't know. I did the backstage stuff, and then I did kind of like some roles where it was like, okay, well, you're not the pretty one, you know, or whatever. And, you know, that just opens up so much conversation around the, ro the only roles that are available for women and how mm -hmm. it's, you know, if you look any sort of different from the main role, you're maybe the funny one or that's it, you know, you don't get the part. So I'd love that. And I, you know, I kind of started doing some sort of sketch comedy in a queer space. And We're done. We're one of my drag queen friends oh, needed a sidekick <laughs> that was a guy. And so I kind of started doing that. And then, you know, it just sort of took so off. And I, check in over on I entered, before I did, you know, the whirlwind sort of competition it, with Nina's competition, I, I did this small kind of drag king thing. And so that's where I met Becky and Kristen, uh, the Rev and Topher Wright. And I, I, it was this moment where I just got to, I got to be a creative director and I got to be the guy role and I got to do all of these different things. And you know, when I, if you would ask me 5,000 years ago when I started doing drag, you know, why did I do this? Well, it's because I got to do the guy thing. But, you know, if you at, fast forward how, 15, 12, 15 years, I got to learn so much more about me. And, I, and, and you know, my wife and I have two children. And what, what, what am I going to be for them? And, I, you know, I, it, I think I should. I think I should start testosterone. I think I should do this. And... It's, it's such a hard question that I get these days, you know, why, why do you do this? And it's like, originally, I had this idea, but now it's because I get to stand up here and I get to talk to people about how there is so much gray in, in the questions that we expect to be answered in black and white. And, and if I could just show people that it just doesn't, there, there needs to be no boxes, right? There needs to be no, there, there's no yes or no. It's this gray kind of thing. Then I feel, then, then that is what kind of completes me now as a performer. Excellent. Great. And, um, so, um, all right, I think we're good on timing. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, we're looking forward to joining you at the rest of this conference. And we're going to close this evening with a film clip um, from Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens, uh, which you can get on iTunes and Amazon, um, <laughs> that touches on how drag as an art form sort of shakes up as our assumptions and presumptions. And um, in doing so, it does help us break down those barriers that Ethan's talking about um, to build new social groups and toward building one community of human beings all together. So we'll then have, after the clip, uh, our closing number from our wonderful performers, Anissa Love, Topher Wright, Dr. Cool Ethan, Jaden Jameson, Twinkerbell, the Reverend Roy Rogers, and our new special guest stars, <laughs> Warren Peace and Queen Shiza Hisa. <laughs> <laughs> Always empowering for people in the audience to see the possibilities. We, as, as a country, put so much emphasis on on who we should and who we shouldn't be around. Why not just go out and and be able to meet those people that you wouldn't necessarily ever talk to? You know, work. You know, where I would work. You know, people never had an experience with with drag before, and now they come constantly to the shows. You know, so. I think by doing that, you open up people's minds, you know, to realize that everybody's just human. How many straight people are here tonight? Yeah, thank you for our straight friends coming out and supporting the community. The straight crowd has really revitalized the art form. Um, and being embraced by straight people has, cha has not only challenged their viewpoints, but it's also challenged ours. For me, it's nice to look out and see that there's not a, a divide between the gay and the straight. It's everybody's mixing. 
and everybody's there for two hours really enjoying themselves and, and not caring that they're in a gay bar. My straight friends, they all come, they love it, they have so much fun, and they're always, like, shocked that, you know, wow, you look so, I mean, I look 100% different. Like, you would not recognize me. I think it really breaks down, little by little, every bit of stereotyping there is and every bit of divide between the two communities of being gay and being straight. And I think that's what we should do. Okay, well, I don't, I don't approve of gays but I love you, you know? So that's how it kind of starts. And then it's like, well, I don't approve of gays, but I love you and I love her, you know? And then it just kind of spreads. You know, so I think it's breaking down. I think what really helps is also they have a strong pour at, at the bars, which yeah, like- Yeah, so people get drunk, but yeah, hey, listen, it loosens it up. I don't care how you lose your inhibitions, just lose them. <laughs>so tiny you can't even see me now. <laughs> it's like a, a very dark shadow. <laughs> Here, I don't want that to break. You are amazing and I hope that you win tomorrow. All right, Roger. So, Ethan, uh, you mentioned that through drag, uh, you helped find yourself when it helped you start transitioning more in you know, a deeper personal sense as you started doing a gender transition. And well, I wanted to ask, do any of you know anyone else that drag has, has aided uh, when they weren't otherwise aware of how, but, you know, has aided in starting their transitioning? If you watch the movie, the, um, the black transsexual Akasha, I don't even know if she said this in the movie or not, before she ever thought that there was transsexuals, because I was her drag mother at first, she was just this cute little boy that would come to see me at shows and said, there's something about this that is moving me in this direction. And literally, I was with her when she went and got her first job done. Her booby job was done. <laughs> yeah, so I would say, uh, and there's so many, there's a lot of, I watched drag kings go through, go through this as well. You know, we're t you know, this is like a 10 year period. So I got into it, I met guys that had already transitioned. I met women that were thinking about it and then transitioned and so, I think this is a very, it's a very raw environment where you, you get to, you get to see what's going on outside of you and then decide, I don't know, I think that might be me. And you know, you get to realize all of the reasons that maybe led you to do this in the first place for some people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been fortunate to compete in the pageant systems, and um, I Talk know- up, Tell a little bit about that. Like, what is the pageant system? Uh, drag pageants is like, like drag on steroids. <laughs> we like, you know, or like, we fight with rhinestones and glitter. That's what we do. So it's like a system where you compete in different categories, evening wear, talent, onstage question, interviews. This is on a judging scale, so I mean, it's your resource and resources and time and money that goes into it. It's a serious thing. It's like sports for drag. So um, I've been fortunate that I've met a lot of drag kings who've competed at that level who have since transitioned. You know, I think it's a safe environment for, the, for them to do so. And it's that period of which, you know, it's something they can try on and decide whether at the end of the night it's something they want to keep continuing or, is, you know, like when I leave here, you know, I take my boobs out and I'm perfectly fine. But for others, it's one of those things where they're like, oh, maybe I want to keep my boobs taped up. And so that's when that starts that journey for them. And it's a very, you know, supportive environment for them to do so. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. If I could add on to that, I oh. think it's an interesting issue to talk about the I idea of tran transitioning that, you know, what is that definition? What does that mean? And do you have to go from one binary to another? 
or does drag just open up a space for you to find right. who you are? And I think that that's something that is powerful about it to think about. And um, if you didn't already know by the last names, Ethan and I are our, our husband and wife. <laughs> um, so um, to, to um, expand on that, Ethan had top surgery um, about 10 years ago. Years before. So, you know, when we talked to our, our parents' generation and talked about, my mom said, oh, sh should we start using male pronouns? And I said, no. Sh you know, at that time, Ethan was Liz using female pronouns. And I said, she just doesn't, you know, identify with them. And so sh she just, you know, want to get rid of those. But we're not, you know, we're not talking about testosterone. Let's get rid of those. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Come on, cuteness. I'm looking right at you. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Really enjoying myself. I'm, uh, I have a financial question. What's the cost of entry? Costumes, makeup, and does that become a barrier to who can access? Millions of dollars. <laughs> does that become a barrier to who can access drag? Yeah, mm. that's a great question. Yeah. I will start. <laughs> Um, I will say that it, things have changed since I started. This is my 19th year of doing drag. Um, whatever, count, count, catch me at 20. Catch me at 20. Um, I sometimes, because I look at it, it's a business for me. I love the art of everything. However, there's an investment that I've made in the money. And I have a book, and I'm still old school, so I have a book, an actual book. So I know from every show I've done, the amount of money I've put in and the amount of money I've received, and that will counteract. Now, I'll be honest, this dress that is excessively too short that I never tried on um, <laughs> was $200. Yeah. That, and clearly, I'm gonna find another time yeah. to use this dress <laughs> with a big Harvard H on it. But <laughs> you think, you'd have to think about the cost of makeup, you think about duct taping, binding, transportation, all of that goes in but I have turned it into, um, I'm an individual sole proprietor, proprietor, so I am a whiz at tax deduction. <laughs> Trust me. And honestly, Virginia was the one that got me there because I was just spending thousands of dollars and knowing in my mind it was coming back in cash, but I had nothing to show for it but more glittery things. I bought a home with drag. I paid off my college loans with drag. I'm trying to buy a new car with drag. And this is now a part-time job for me, so I have other income, but it's my love because I get to, to meet you. And so at the end of the day, the money doesn't outweigh the joy that I get to have, regardless of, of the intake, do you know what I mean? So I still get this in, beautiful in, like, connection with each and every one of you, because we have this moment tonight, and it'll never be captured again, where I'll make some more dollars another day. You know what I mean? So money will come and go, but this stuff is the best part about all of it. <laughs> To answer that question, I mean, yes, drag is an investment, but you slowly build your toolbox. That's what it is. You don't drop a hole because no one gets into drag thinking, I'm going to get rich. <laughs> no, no. So you slowly learn to build your toolbox. Like, I didn't go out and buy the most expensive makeup. You know, I started off with CVS makeup and then I cut corners where I could. Um, honestly, like, yeah, Goodwill is the best well, way to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, if you learn how to tailor your own clothes, I'm the size of a 10 year old boy. <laughs> and, you know, like I learned how to sew, and, you know, I only need one yard of fabric, so that costs me $5. You know, and everyone thinks I'm a wizard. I'm like, no, it only cost me $5. Yeah. And I mean, we, we share a lot, you know, like, yeah. like share costumes, share. Their facial hair. I mean, a little bit of Becky's facial hair tonight. You know, it's well, fine. So, like, um, if you're if you're fortunate enough to to start doing drag, where um, you become friends with the, with the folks you're doing, you get to know them. Um, I mean, the the resources in the community and with you know YouTube and all the things that the kids are doing today online. Uh, there's just so many resources I feel like out there that have helped at least in the past 15 years since I've been doing drag. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing is, if you are fortunate, fortunate enough to receive enough visibility, you end up with sponsorships. I'm actually sponsored by TransTape, who who's, provides all the tape I need. Anytime I need tape, they provide it for me. So I'm starting to get people who want me to, you know, use their products. 
I think that um, drag is also a mentorship community, mm -hmm. um, and so there is a there is a culture of um, perpetuating, you know, bringing people up through the the education process. The the you know people all have a drag mom, a drag dad. People all have um, drag babies. You know, it's a, it's a true family, and the the tradition of kind of that that culture of bringing people up, and so you learn, you kind of learn those tricks as you're coming up with the help of your elders. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm very comfortable saying that because I think I was very fortunate to be exposed to that when I was quite young. My question is for the entire panel, but I think specifically perhaps for parents. Um, what do you hope that these types of movies will do for the next generation of young folk being raised as this as their norm? Oh, I can start that question because um, one of the reasons that I, I think I'm, I think I'm wired actually. Oh. So um, one of the reasons that I made the film and I pitched it to my sisters was that I went to a drag show, which I, the, the couple that was in the, uh, move, the clips that you saw when they were talking about, I don't know if you tape it, and they were having that whole conversation the that's balls. so charming. Yeah. <laughs> um, My best friend. They, yeah, that, the um, bald guy is my close friend, Seth, and um, I had known him in a writing group, and then he invited me to, he said, do you want to come to a show that my husband's in? And I said, oh, sure, you know, be supportive of your husband. And, uh, and then it was this enormous drag show, and his husband's one of the top queens in Columbus. And so it was just an incredible uh, variation of performance, and exciting, and splendid, and spectacular. And yet also, I had um, toddler children, a son and a daughter. Uh, and in Technicolor up on stage was being played out the issues that I was thinking about every day of how they were being immediately gendered into these binary camps and given expectations and toys and um, you know from being hairless babies in a yellow onesie and how people would have their expectations they'd put on them with whatever whatever biological sex they thought they were and so I went home and called up my sisters and said could we make this documentary, and I think it'd be really a great window into talking about this, and the impact I was hoping to have was to actually talk about this to open up possibilities for, for parents and children um, and people to sort of self-define. And I said it would take us six months or something, and it was. <laughs> and it took 25 years. <laughs> Hi, my name is Priscilla. Welcome to Harvard. I'm delighted that Thank you guys you. are here, <laughs> all of you are here. My question is about health care, access to medical care, and there's so much in the news about these backroom operations, um, going into a hospital, not being accepted, either you, your partner. What has that changed? What, what's happening in that whole realm? So, uh, so I'll just talk about that for a second. We, my wife and I, we've been married for uh oh, <laughs> twenty-five That's years. So typical. <laughs> we've been married for years. <laughs> we, we were living in Ohio when we had Lila, our daughter, and I'm not a, I'm not on her birth certificate, so you know I. I, I was fortunate enough, we had our baby at Ohio State, which is a very inclusive environment, so I was fortunate enough to be there. This was before I had started testosterone, so Mara and I were two moms having a baby, but, and they were very, they were very sweet, and, and you know, Mara took on a lot of this herself because she knew how upset I was about it, uh, but I wasn't involved in the conversation when you know, the social worker comes into the delivery room to sign the birth certificate, and I'm still not on the birth certificate uh, for Lila. So that was difficult, you know? That was very hard. And the, the opposite of that was really upsetting to me when I had started this transition, and for our second child, Amos, who we call Tuggy, uh, when Tuggy was born, it wasn't a question because I was just presenting as something else and it wasn't a conversation. And 
it was it was upsetting to me because I had gone through that whole thing before and now there's just this assumption that sure you're involved and you know you're obviously the dad and the and you know you can be on this now because it's okay because you're presenting one way so it was it was very tough for for myself um, but I have to credit my wife who I've been married to for years <laughs> <laughs> So that first of all, um, when Lila's four and a half, so this was she was born before Doma was passed, and so that um, passage uh, provided a whole slew of rights for our friends in Columbus. And then we moved to Connecticut um, two years ago, and and there was a conversation with our son's birth, and because the birth certificate asks, "Do you know the child's biological father?" And we had a long conversation. We went back and forth. The social worker made a bunch of different phone calls and then she finally was just like, yes, yes. Yes is the answer. Because whether or not Ethan was presenting as male or female, we didn't have his sperm. <laughs> it wasn't. There isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really quick, because you mentioned the backdoor operations. And I was speaking, hey, look at that, I'm the black person on the panel, too. Um, a lot of, I've had many sisters pass away because of these surgeries. That's something that needs to be regulated, especially within the South, which is very odd. But like within South Florida, there's, there was just a transsexual woman arrested because she was doing injections and those illegal injections caused multiple deaths, two of which were my personal friends. With one of them, I'm wearing her earrings right now. So, um, Tanisha, she's amazing. So, it's hard when you're already an entertainer um, by yourself to get health care. You, that's, that's something that you're going to have to spend money on Cobra, and you're spending all this extra money. So, for example, um, the nightclub I worked in years ago, mm, uh, actually right around the same time the movie was being filmed, I um, severed one of my toes, a tendon in my big toe. Ugh. And I had to pay for that out of pocket because I didn't have a full-time job because at that point I was still running around auditioning as a singer and doing all this. So years of me trying to pay for the surgery that the company I worked for wouldn't cover cuts to now and I'm in a different life and now I'm using Anissa as a source of income plus my full-time job offers me, all-inclusive me, if I could, I could be on this stage and break something and my health insurance from my full-time job will cover it regardless. So it's, it's really with time and acceptance. However, we need to legislate all of the um, illegalities because no matter what we find, there's always gonna be someone else that wants to try it cheaper. And sometimes cheaper is not better. And I am a budget bitch. <laughs> I am the first person that will find a, a, a see-through way out of something, but it's not my health. <laughs> Lord knows it won't be my health. What's going on? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Let me add really quick one thing. The movie is being used with medical conferences now, actually, as an education tool. So that's been really exciting because um, it's mm -hmm. been proven effective as a way to, uh, not necessarily for just trans people, but the idea of doing gender performance or presenting in a different way, and what could be a way to educate caretakers on different modes that people might be dressing or presenting themselves and the health implications of that. And so that's been an exciting part of progress. Great. Thanks again for being here. My question is about the mixing that was mentioned with the Nina West competition, um, where you have you know traditional drag queen space now filled with performers on a broader gender spectrum. Do you, have you found that that's promoted a deeper understanding of intersectionality and is it translating into coalition building and other aspects of the community? Oh, you should answer that. And I'm particularly curious about the straight audiences that are coming, maybe for a spectacle and a stiff drink. Are they turning around and then supporting you at the community health center fundraiser and the ballot box and that sort of thing? I can say, and I'll speak just for a quick, I'll make it really quick. Nina's one of my best friends. To be fair, we started doing drag the exact same day, exact same place. And I just took another name, she took West. Um, it has been amazing over the past 20 years to watch the crowds go from all gay men and then right around the late 90s, like oh, say early 2000s, there were this amazing group of lesbians that started showing up. <laughs> then they started, <laughs> <laughs> they started 
telling their straight friends. And my mom, my mother was at every show I did when I first started because she wanted to make sure my hair was right. <laughs> Trust me. So now we have these amazing partners across the globe and across the spectrum that are there cheering us on, giving their money, and they're using their voice to help us raise awareness and funds for healthcare with our, um, in Columbus it's Equitas, who does um, mm -hmm. every part of any healthcare a person needs, but from Planned Parenthood to everything. And in Columbus, we've raised over $2 million, and we would never have been able to do that without straight people coming to every one of our shows and giving their money. Last week, we raised $7,000 in, it was 15 minutes. $7,000 in 15 minutes on a Sunday show. And all of that money went to the Mosaic Project, which is a form of Equitas Health, which only goes, that money will be moved towards um, transgender, non-binary people of color, of youth. So, that, and it's the only program like that, and then the other half will go to, um, it's going to the Ronald McDonald House. So, we, I'm fortunate to live in Columbus still, to where we can make all of this money and still help our community. So at the end of the night, I can put my head on the pillow and know that we've done something wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, and that would never happen without straight people. Yes. So, yeah, we have time for a couple more, so we should. Hi, my name is Patrick. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, my question um, is mainly goes to the producers of the film, but this can be addressed with, from everyone on the panel. Um, but I'm thinking specifically that it is 2019, which will mark 50 years since the Stonewall Uprising. And, and I think it's important that we honor our trans and queer women of color who really who really launched that fight for us. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's Marsha, Mother Marsha, that's right, and Sylvia and Ms. Major. Um, but I also am wondering too, with this particular documentary, which I think the films, that, the clips that we've seen have been wonderful. Um, I'm, and, and I noticed that um, a couple times in the film that Paris is Burning was mentioned, which largely featured folks of color in the ballroom scene, things of that nature. And so I'm wondering, as we think about you know drag today, how are we continuing to honor those initial authors of that culture in a way that can still kind of center them and sort of honor them today, especially as we think about how far we've come as a movement and as we continue to honor our trans and queer um, folks of color ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, really quick, only because, and that's <laughs> A, point on. In Columbus, it's still, we're still in Ohio, so you have to really understand that there are not very many African American people of color that are performers. And they're not at the, not, and I'm not saying the level where I am, I am one of the most visible people of color you will see in the state of Ohio, only because I'm old <laughs> and I'm very outspoken. So when the movie was filmed, since that move, since this has launched, there has been this resurgence of all of these amazing queer people of color that are walking and giving life and living just like I did when I first saw Paris is Burning and I was definitely a teenager. <laughs> yeah. So now, like, we had a ball. We had a ball, and we brought in, Jesus, there were like four different houses, and to be fair, my drag mother is a Balenciaga. If you know anything, Raquel Lord, Balenciaga yeah. from Atlanta is my drag mother. So we had this amazing ball at Axis Nightclub, which 10 years ago would have never happened because if you weren't a twinky white kid, you would not have been accepted. And then I turned the corner and walked into my home and saw all these beautiful shades of brown, yellows, white, and it took me back and it made me cry because the work that we're all doing is making this happen mm -hmm. on an everyday basis in every one of our towns. So it's happening. It may not happen as fast as you want it to, but bitch, it's <laughs> happening. Yeah, well, I wanted to add one Can thing, I yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Can you, um, I, also, Boston. I do recognize that as a POC performer, I think it's, especially among drag kings, I think I can count seven Asians in the United States, drag kings. And I understand, like, Fia's a little bit about my background. I'm from a boat family. You know, grew up with that cultural, uh, you know, stressors that I had to be feminine, passive. And so I, I do this because I want to be visible for others. And I, I take that, you know, seriously. And so this is why I go out there and do these educational things, because they're my jam. Um, yeah, so uh, just so that others can see me and they can feel welcome into the scene because sometimes it can be, especially as a king, it can be somewhat intimidating. So, I mean, especially these are spaces are, you know, ran, ran by men, you know? So as a drag king, it's even more, I bear a greater responsibility in being a role model out there. 
just being visible. Uh, <laughs> so in producing the film, one thing that was really important to us was not having mediators sort of talking heads, or there was one idea that people came in and said, well, why don't you sort of say, what was your experience, Gabrielle, of coming into this community and what you learned? And, and it was really important to have people speak for themselves and have their experiences and show how complex they were. That there's one part of the structure of editing, which is that one person will say a definitive statement, and then often there's other people sort of saying different things. And so showing all the way through the film that there's this, um, that there are many voices and there's many, many, um, it was important to us to represent the range of people who are performing and have them speak in their own voices. And I think that that's part of the educational mission is also then having these conversations so that people can see themselves on screen mm -hmm. and also then maybe continue to learn about the history from seeing what's happening now and how it's changing. Yeah, and we stand on the shoulders of all those activists who have come before us and everything in the, in the history that Radcliffe is about preserving and, and exploring in, in all of these realms of intersectional um, being. And, and I think that the, the kings and queens and trans and other gender performers in Columbus often actually mention um, that at shows. And we certainly feel it, us five sisters in filmmaking, that we stand on the shoulders of the women who've come before us and, and um, hopefully we'll be lifting up other people in the future on our shoulders. Oh, you can see the movie on iTunes or Amazon. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to move this without breaking everything. Okay. Like, uh, hi, I'm Jack. Um, uh, my question was that as like a trans mask person who's also really always been interested in drag and like drag king performances, like all that good stuff, I found myself like caught in this other like bogus binary of authenticity and artifice, um, which I think becomes coded, right, because like sexism as masculine and feminine, right? Like masculine are, is authentic, feminine is artificial and fabricated, and like that's all, I love drag because it then like takes and just like, well, everything is authentic and nothing is authentic and everything is, is artifice and nothing is. Um, so it's this awesome like postmodern thing. But <laughs> like how do you engage and hold like, like that performativity and artifice as like an, like an extension or a problematizing of the idea of authenticity when it's like on your body um, or in a community. So like talking, the person who was talking about um, the gatekeeping that happens in trans community sometimes around like, oh, you're ruining it for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, so when so much of our lives is dependent on like living our most authentic self, right? That's the branding. How do we then like love artifice and love drag? Oh, interesting. That's a great question. There are no great you should, you should, you should <laughs> take I, it. I could, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, for me, I feel kind of most in myself that I, I feel some of the most authentic in those moments. I feel some of the most authentic when I can step up, you know, when I was younger, I literally had no friends. I spent years of my life eating lunch alone. And in this family, being able to step in, in, into this, into these roles, I'm able to practice, you know, radical inclusivity by seeing people and by really trying to like connect with everyone. Tonight when I was in the audience giving hugs to people is because I just like what we were talking about earlier, just, it's those connections that are so important. So to me, I think take a deep breath, step into it and, there is no greater time than I am at my full true self when I am standing up blasting in this costume and I feel like it's me turned up to full blast. To and 11. That's to 11. And that's <laughs> how good. Well, would Robin and he said, do you want to talk a little bit about the yeah. artifice now that you're in artifice? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what would you say to that? I think that's an interesting question to throw to you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, one of the things that, that strikes me is really the importance of mirrors. I, because I actually, I mean, I, I have the experience of being dressed up. I actually have no idea really he does, he how, doesn't what know I look like. like. Right. Um, we purposely Should we bring the mirror? Should, should we no bring idea. a mirror over? Would you like to see? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Like, legit, has no, got dressed in the dark. What about no you, idea. Robin? Do you, have you Robin? seen yourself? I would love to see myself. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
think it's better than I do. Sorry, Kelsey. I like the artifice. Why do you say I look better? And so, yeah, what what is it? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think I, I really do feel that, that I'm exploring another possibility of myself. <laughs> a, a better possibility. Than yeah. I feel very hot. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Robin? Um, I'm wearing my own clothes. Uh, these are my clothes. So um, I actually feel kind of ordinary. I love wearing a tux. I'll wear a tux any excuse I get. So. Um, this is very limited artifice for me. The face is very new. Um, but the, what, what I can see, like I can't see my own face. Um, so what I can see, what I can experience is actually um, a delight and um, not totally uh, unknown to me. So it, it doesn't feel like artifice, it feels like me. Um, but I just, I, I want to take this moment to just say thank you so much to, um, to this troupe and to the producers and to Wen in particular for doing my makeup, which is amazing. Um, so I just want to say thank you for this extraordinary experience. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you. And we should turn it over to Lisa, I think. It was such a go for a moment, but this bitch is pretty. <laughs> So, he said you have to, do you want to wrap up? We have we one have more one question, question, but do you want to? Uh, do we want to take one more question? Or do you? I was, I was going to ask you what you were thinking right now, but you already, you just basically, <laughs> <laughs> you already talked about that. So, unless you want to go on a little bit more. No, no. no. Uh, so, let me, let me wrap up. First of all, I, I, I want to echo Robin and, and really thank, uh, especially Gabrielle and, and Jen for putting yeah. this all together. Yeah and bring these, you know, this fantastic group. Uh, Corey was fantastic. I mean, not only as a, as a you. you know, as an artist in, in performing and, and putting this together, but, 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 but this whole group, I think, you can really feel the sense of community that, 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 um, that everybody has. That it's expressed in the movie, but, but, but experiencing it live, I think that was the most, you know, um, profound experience for me. You know, this, this the um, becoming a beautiful person, is a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> you were already beautiful, bitch. Oh, yeah. You were already beautiful. Uh, we just put away. But this experience of the community, I think, is really something very special. Um, I also want to just uh, thank Becky Wasserman at Academic Ventures at Rutgers. Yeah. so much work. For coming tonight. Um, I hope at least some of you will be able to come to the conference tomorrow, um, which we have another very different but fantastic <laughs> set of speakers and presentations that, that I'm, I'm sure will be just as interesting as, as this evening. So thank you very much. And we want to just do a shout yeah. out to Becky and Jessica and the whole AV crew and everybody who's Steve, behind the scenes. Steve, Steve, Steve insecurity. Steve. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kisa and Robin. Amazing, courage, wonderful volunteers, and just throwing themselves fully into this experience and having us here at, at Radcliffe. It was really wonderful. We're thrilled to yeah. be here. Thank you all. Thank you. So much.